Hi, everyone, and welcome to Radio Cloud Native from Rantis. Every week, we break down tech news in the cloud native world and beyond. I'm Eric Gregory. And I'm Nick Chase. This week, we'll be talking about the massive ransomware attack in Costa Rica, a new secure supply chain initiative from Google Cloud, some new releases in the cloud native world, and more. And, and I miss the music. I miss the music <laughs> at the beginning. We'll, we'll dance next cool. week. I know, man. I'll tell you. All right. So, Eric, the, tell us about this. Uh, tell us about what's going on with this uh, Google. What's what's going on over there? Yeah. So at Google Cloud's annual security summit this week, the company announced a new initiative to address software supply chain security. The Assured Open Source Software Service is a program to provide enterprise and government users with scanned and Google signed open source packages from Google's secure registry. At first, they're focusing on Java and Python packages, since those have, quote, particularly high risk profiles, unquote, as Google Cloud VP and GM Sunil Putty told the register, uh, probably thinking of Log4j there, among <laughs> other things. Yes. Uh, a big part of the effort seems to be spinning out Google's internal processes into a customer facing service. So packages are subject to a compliance standard based on binary authorization for Borg, which is the internal standard used for all production workloads at Google and has been for about a decade. In an interview with Protocol, Google Cloud's Chief Information Security Officer, Phil Venables, noted that the Assured Open Source software offering would be available to customers running on other platforms. Quote, it is a Google Cloud delivered product, but we're not just going to do this for things that run on Google Cloud. It could be for any software that enterprises consume uh, into their on-premises systems, or in fact, other clouds, unquote. Elsewhere, he says, Quote, to just focus on Google Cloud, we wouldn't be serving our customers. Our customer's reality is a hybrid multi-cloud environment, unquote. So to me, the two big takeaways here are, one, here's another acknowledgement of the importance and growing primacy of hybrid multi-cloud. And two, secure supply chain is really top of mind after these la uh, the last year or so. What do you make of it, Nick? Uh, yeah, I mean, definitely it's interesting to see a one of the hyperscalers basically embracing the hybrid model and saying, yeah, you know what, we, we get it, you, you know, you're not all here, uh, which is, which is probably good, you know, considering the, the distance between them and, and say AWS at the top of the, the food chain. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the emphasis on the secure supply chain to me is the the most important thing you're right um java is is probably related to the log for shell issue and then uh python packages there's there's been a um, a similar thing going on with the python shell um so it's good that they're kind of starting there um, the notion of having a secure supply chain wherever you are is good. Do we know if there's, um, any kind of, I mean, obviously if you're using Google cloud, there's the charges involved in that. Do we know if there are any charges involved in using these packages on other clouds? I'm assuming so, but I can't say definitively. Yeah. Uh, they talk about it as being a Google Cloud delivered service. Uh, so I think you're probably a paying customer who's having that service. Uh, yeah, probably. You know, yeah. piped over to where you know AWS or on premises or whatever. Well, so it's one way to it's one way to retain your your customers. You know, can't can't really argue with that. Um, so security wise, this all makes a huge amount of sense particularly today. So let's talk about the big story, uh, which is Costa Rica. Now, um, the Costa Rican government uh, has declared a state of emergency. Let's talk about Let's talk about that. So lots of ransomware news this week, uh, including the closure of Lincoln University after 157 years due to an attack that originated in Iran, in Iran destroyed its um, uh, recruiting, retention, and fundraising systems. But the, like I said, the big news is the state of emergency declared by Costa Rica. So on April 17th, uh, the Russian-speaking Conti ransomware organization targeted the government of Costa Rica. Um, at the time, they said they had attacked uh, 
five different agencies. It turned out later that it was 27 agencies. Um, they threatened to release uh, information if the government didn't pay $10 million in ransom. Thing is, Costa Rica has laws that prohibit paying ransom. So Conti uh, released about a terabyte of data, which it claimed to have gotten off something like 800 servers to which it had gained access. Uh, in particular, it released 900 gigabytes of data from the tax administration portal and claimed that it had implemented a large number of backdoors in various public ministries and private companies. Uh, they also said they would continue these attacks until they got paid. Now, while this seems like a straight up criminal attack, the outgoing Costa Rican president, Carlos Alvarado Quesada, uh, Quesada, uh, gave a statement on April 22nd that said the attack was aimed at destabilizing the country's transition to its newly elected president, former World Bank official, Rodrigo Chavez. Um, and you can insert your own presidential transition disruption joke here. Um, but that wasn't it wasn't that crazy a claim because at that point, the government was losing about $200 million a day uh, because customs and other systems were still shut down. Uh, then on April 25th, Conti encrypted all of the administrative systems of the government agency managing the electricity in Cartago, uh, a town of 160,000 people, though power and internet were unaffected. May 8th, new president takes office. First thing he did was sign an order creating a state of emergency over the attack in order to give the government more agility in responding. By this past Monday, the group was calling on the citizens of Costa Rica, the group being Conti, was calling on the citizens of Costa Rica to overthrow the government and replace it with another more willing to pay them. Supposedly, they had already released 97% of the data they had stolen, and some experts point to the call as a sign that the group was running low on incentive for Costa Rica to pay. But then they doubled the ransom to $20 million and threatened to basically delete the keys to decrypt everything if that was not paid by this coming Monday. So who are these people? Who is Conti? So according to Threat Post, quote, Conti acts as a ransomware as a service on a, a ransomware as a service model with a vast network of affiliates and access brokers at its disposal to do its dirty work. The group also is known for targeting organizations for which attacks could have life threatening consequences, such as hospitals, emergency number dispatch carriers, emergency medical services and law enforcement agencies, unquote. Uh, the FBI says that they emerged in July of 2020. Since they emerged in July of 2020, Conti has hit over 1,000 victims with over $150 million in payouts. Now, the fact that they're not afraid to go after governments is an interesting wrinkle. On April 27th, they hit Peru's intelligence agency. Uh, the United States government is offering a $10 million reward for information about any of the group's leaders with another $5 million reward for someone involved in any of their attacks. But the most chilling thing is that on May 9th, um, a hacker supposedly involved in the attack wrote, among other things, that, quote, in the future, I will definitely carry out attacks of a more serious format with a larger team. Costa Rica is a demo version, unquote. So, Eric, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, what's interesting here is the this is serious. Yeah, it, it's the elevation of scale. I mean, uh, I'm thinking about four or five years ago, a friend of mine works uh, at, at a library, part of a municipal government, and th that municipal government was attacked uh, like this, and, and they yeah. didn't end up paying the ransom, and so their IT systems were down for a shocking amount of time, like like six months. Uh, and, wow. uh, you know, a lot of pretty important data was lost, and ultimately they just had to kind of deal with it and, and rebuild their IT systems. Um, it's interesting to see that kind of, uh, you know, digital total annihilation threat leveled at not a municipal government, not a, a business, not an agency of a government, but a government in totality, right? Uh, like 27 agencies, you said, of, of uh, Costa yeah. Rica. That's sort of construing 
your target in, in a very different way uh, and then engaging on a whole new sort of conceptual layer. Uh, so what I mean by that is is this idea of, all right, you guys should overthrow your government to one that's willing to pay us. That's a whole different ballgame than when you get into when you're going back and forth with, with even like one agency of a particular government when, when you're engaging the nation state itself um it's it's interesting to see that that jump and, and as you say it's, it's frightening but also they, they seem to be taking a real risk there i mean you know nation states as a whole react in a very different way than even uh one agency uh, yeah it's it's a um it is a huge elevation as you say and there are a lot of different wrinkles going on here. Um, supposedly, uh, supposedly there are actually people within the government that are participating in this. And and we've talked about this in the past that you know these these ransomware gangs they have so much money that they offer insiders you know money for credentials and you know people just do it. Um, there's also there's also the incentive that these gangs have because people as a rule just pay because they just want to, they just want it to be over 95. There was a survey. Uh, I think it was something like it was 95%, I believe of victims of ransomware said that um, if it happened again, they would just pay again, mm. you know, and uh, it, it, it's never going to stop. <laughs> if that, if that's, um, if that's what happens, but the, the thing is that let's, let's talk about politics for just a moment because Conti has been very clear that as an organization, they, um, they support the Russian invasion of, um, Ukraine. Okay, you know, when I pointed out they're a Russian speaking group, um, they've they've come right out and said, we support the invasion of Ukraine. And in fact, uh, right after the invasion, other members of the group who, you know, were Ukrainian, there was a big rift there. They uh, released a ton of data. Uh, you know, a ton of chats and everything like that. And that's why we know a lot about how Conti um, uh, operates because of this, because they were just ticked off uh, at, at the group's um, position. But the point here is that they've taken a very political stance and they've said that they will go after basically anyone who is working against this invasion. This is a criminal gang who is taking a political stance. Um, now, what does that have to do with everyone else? Well, there is a lot of potential collateral damage here. Um, if a government, if an entire government can be brought down, what can you do? Well, there are actually things that you can do and you should be doing because even if you're not going to be targeted for political reasons at some point, even if you're, even if you're not big, you have a very good potential to be hit. So what do you do? You must have, you must have a culture of security. Okay. Take advantage of multi-factor um, authentication. It's not enough, but you need to at least do that. It's necessary, but not sufficient. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Um, you need to make sure that you have audit trails as much as possible. So you know what is going on. But to me, the most important thing and the thing that everybody seems to be forgetting about is you must have a disaster recovery plan. A disaster recovery plan doesn't keep you from being hit by ransomware. It doesn't keep you from getting hit by other, you know, hackers. A, re a disaster recovery plan is what you invoke when all else fails. So if Costa Rica had a robust 
disaster recovery plan, they could basically just tell Conti to, you know, go stuff shove, themselves. Shove off. Shove off. Yes. <laughs> um, and rebuild their systems and be done. And the shocking thing is how few organizations have this in place. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, right now I'm, I'm working on right now I'm working on a book uh, about this disaster recovery for mere mortals. Um, if you want it, let me know and, uh, we'll, I'll send it to you as soon as it's done. Uh, but it's shocking to me how few organizations have this in place. If you don't have a disaster recovery plan today, do it today. Okay. Because this is coming. Okay. Sermon over. Anything <laughs> else you wanted to say? On that? No, other than that, uh, you know, I, I entirely agree, right? It's, uh, I, I think, really fundamental to, you know, our, our remit uh, talking about the this cloud native space to the kind of technologies yeah. that, uh, you know, are really central to our, our focus here. This is a huge part of the capability that is... You know, something like Kubernetes can enable for an organization. And it's maybe particularly frustrating not to be taking advantage of functionality that's 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 right there, you know? Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a potential <laughs> that's sit, sitting right there waiting for you. Um, yes, yes, it's it's there. It's there. Do do it. Do it today. If, if you don't know how to do it, you know, if, if you don't know how to do it, there's plenty of resources out there. Like I said, contact, contact me, send me an email and chase at Marantis.com. I will, I will get you started. You know, I'm not an expert, but you know, I I've been consulting with a lot of experts on this book. Just get started today. Okay. Uh, what do we got next? Well, uh, uh, speaking of both, it. speaking of both Kubernetes and security, um, <laughs> You know, not all security disasters are the result of uh, terrifying outside attacks. Um, as as Radiohead's Tom York sings in Just, you do it to yourself, you do. And that's why it really hurts. <laughs> so Red Hat released a Kubernetes security survey this week, concluding that widespread human error is leading to security incidents with Kubernetes. Humans, man, can't live with them, can't live without them. <laughs> uh, the sample in the survey is 300 professionals, but the big numbers on some of the answers are suggestive of some trends. So 55% reported that they had to delay the debut of an app due to security concerns, and 93% reported a security incident in their Kubernetes clusters in the last year. The report pointedly cites a World Economic Forum report claiming that quote, 95% of cybersecurity issues can be traced to human error, unquote. And I should note here that when you follow the sources, the World Economic Forum doesn't actually ultimately cite a source for that number, so I'm not sure where it comes from, but, uh, you know, human error, it, it happens. Um, maybe We've all been there, man. <laughs> right. Uh, so maybe you don't want to take that statistic to your next, like, incident response meeting, but, you know, uh, it, it informs our thinking here. So ultimately, the study concludes that Kubernetes as a system focuses on productivity to the detriment of security and that the overall complexity of the system creates an environment where we bumbling humans are even more prone to error. Uh, so, you know, Nick, what do we make of this conclusion? Do we agree? And if it's true, what can organizations do about it? Yeah, we we, I, we absolutely uh, agree. Um, I, I remember back back in my days when I was involved more involved in the Kubernetes community than I am now. There was a lot of discussion about that. That um, and and developers as a rule are more interested in in moving things forward and and getting their features in than they are interested in security. Um, it's just human nature. I was about to say, developers as a subset of human beings, kind of following on from what we were just talking about. You know. Exactly correct. Yes, developers as a subset of human beings. And and you can't blame them for that. And, and this applies not just to the not just to the people who built Kubernetes, but it applies to the developers that you employ right now. Um, they don't think about security because they're not trained in security. You can't blame them for that. Um, 
maybe that is the issue. Maybe we need to be training our developers in security uh, more than more than we have. Um, it it would be good, you know. It's good to have things like, um, uh, uh, you know, part of your CI/CD, like when we use uh, Miranda Secure Registry, you know, that we scan uh, we scan containers before they go in for vulnerabilities. But developers should be thinking about security as they as they build rather than um rather than trying to bolt it on later um, and the kubernetes community realized this i think a couple of years ago um and started to move more towards hey maybe we should think about this <laughs> but by then that train was flying down the track man um so trying to fix the tracks uh, with the train coming down uh, is, is very is very difficult and scary yeah very very difficult and and scary i mean what are your thoughts on ways to kind of avoid this problem uh so the two approaches that um you know i've seen major organizations advocating and i think makes sense are uh, you can go for a, a more managed kubernetes approach right so you uh are bringing in people with more of that security training, more of that security expertise to try to manage, uh, at least at the operations level, what they can. Um, you can try to automate some of the operations of your system. Ultimately, you're going to have human beings touching it somewhere. Um, and then, uh, you know, as you were saying, kind of a, the, the shift left approach, uh, trying to, you know, bring that into your, your overall uh, organizational strategy. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we have the shift. I think you need the shift left approach, where developers are thinking about this earlier in the process. But you also need the shift right approach, which is a new term that I've just heard recently, which is uh, to make sure that after it's in production, you have that monitoring going on. Um, you know, I think the days of you know set it and forget it are long gone. Um, you. I, I think I came to that conclusion when I found out about crypto miners, you know, where it's like where, where they, my, my favorite crypto mining method that I heard of uh, is when they hack into a website to put it in the JavaScript so that somebody who comes to your website wants to do crypto mining on their machine. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm like what the? Yeah, I was like, are you kidding? So, um, yeah, so this this notion of you you can't just kind of leave it and uh, assume that everything is going to be okay. You have to keep an eye on it, uh, and I think we are going to see increased automation um, as, as AI ops. Um, comes forward it's it's going to be it's just going to be necessary and actually we're going to talk about that uh we're going to talk about that uh, we can talk about that right now actually uh juniper has announced the release of contrail networking cloud or cn2 uh, uh cloud work uh, contrail networking cloud cloud native or cn2 uh, this new version of contrail has been designed to be compliant with the container networking interface or cni so you can use it with kubernetes as well as continuing its compatibility with openstack uh, it's also designed to create a single unified networking environment for a multi-cluster or a hybrid environment. Uh, in a blog post, the company also announced a new Contrail plugin for the Lens Kubernetes platform, as well as integration with all of the other Kubernetes tools we're used to using to manage Kubernetes resources. Interestingly, in the same blog post, uh, the, the same blog post also casually mentions that, quote, additionally, CN2 was built privately as closed source. Instead of open sourcing, as with previous versions 21.4 and prior, version 22.1 will mark CN2's introduction and those that want access can get free trial licenses from Juniper, exclamation point, <laughs> unquote. Like, this is a good thing. <laughs> you know, um, 
what, whenever I look on Hacker News or you know Reddit or Twitter, I just see like developers lining up to say close source close. <laughs> <laughs> especially for products that were previously open sources oh my god really i mean you know at, at least i gotta say i gotta say they're owning it yeah yeah they leaned you know, in. they're like this is what we did they're like oh okay yeah they're not <laughs> you know they're they're not beating around the bush but uh in 2019 juniper bought mist systems for 405 million dollars uh the company specializes in ai enabled networking in other words what we're now calling ai ops and this week juniper ceo rami rahim told the company's global summit that he thinks artificial intelligence will be completely automating networks within five years so um you know that's what we were talking about you know, a minute ago that, you know, you just can't, uh, just can't set it and forget it. So, oh, just security, security, security. So, um, and while we're on the subject of networking, uh, interesting development in the world of service mesh. Now, when you say service mesh, the first thing that comes to mind is probably Istio, but at the heart of Istio is a component called Envoy. Uh, now members of the steering group for Envoy Gateway, uh, including Envoy creator Matt Klein and representatives from Ambassador Labs, Fidelity Investments, Tetrate, and VMware have announced their joint commitment to the project, which launched on Monday at KubeCon under the auspices of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, Envoy Gateway is a new effort within the Envoy Proxy open source project to simplify, simplify Envoy use in cloud native application development. According to the announcement, Envoy Gateway will reduce existing redundant efforts around Envoy and make it easier for application developers to use Envoy as a basic API gateway, quote, out of the box, unquote, and as a Kubernetes ingress controller, exposing a simplified set of APIs and implementing the Kubernetes Gateway API. Uh, Envoy Gateway makes it easier to extend Envoy. Developers will now have a cost-free, unfettered way to provide external access to their work in progress, unquote. Oh, no, that's not a quote. That's dirt on my monitor. <laughs> at, the, at the same time, Envoy Gateway will not replace API management features currently found in commercial products. So that's an interesting uh, little wrinkle right there. Envoy is already widely used for traffic between separate services in a microservices environment uh, that is... Uh, East-West traffic with Envoy Gateway. Envoy will also be easy to use for North-South traffic, that is traffic between an application and the outside world, as with consumers of an application's APIs. So, uh, yeah, so this is uh, another case of you have an open source project, they're kind of balancing with the commercial projects. Um, but I, I think it's uh, personally, I just think it's interesting to see Envoy, which is at the heart of Istio, <laughs> kind of jumping up and saying, hey, <laughs> we're here too. So what do you think about that? Yeah, that's what, it kind of reminds me of, um, even though totally different uh, world in terms of cloud native tooling, but uh, kind of reminds me of Container D and, and Docker Engine's uh, sort of relationship on the container runtime side, uh, where the component <laughs> inside is like, actually, hello. Yeah, exactly. It's like, you, you know, I can, I can, I'm in here. Hello. <laughs> oh, I know, really. Oh, my goodness. Well, speaking of getting attention. <laughs> oh, that. <laughs> You get like 10 <laughs> uh, segue points for that. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, shifting gears, Elon Musk and Twitter again. Uh, <sighs> you you kind of get the feeling. Like you say, the guy the guy wants to be in the news. <laughs> Appreciate the friendly face. Uh, oh, God. Uh, so last Friday, Musk announced on Twitter, of course, that the Twitter deal was on hold, pending receipt of definitive numbers on the percentage of Twitter users who are actually spam bots. Spam bots, that's the issue now. Twitter says yeah. less than 5% of users are bots or spammers, and Musk claimed on Monday that the number might be between 20 and 90%. Quite oh, a for God's sakes, come quite, on! Quite a range there, right? Um, <sighs> not, neither party cited public sources on this. Um, 
Musk did point to uh, what seemed to be internal documentation saying that the 5% number came from a, a study of 100 users, uh, which, you know, he, he uh, understandably said was a small sample. <laughs> uh, and even, even I agree with that. And, and the Twitter CEO came back saying that uh, actually there were lots of different studies uh, and, and it covered thousands. So who knows? Who knows? We don't have access to these, these sources. Um, but this public tussle over Spambot numbers went down amid two high-level dismissals at the company, GM of Consumer, Kayvon Bigpour, and Revenue Product Lead, Bruce Falk. So what is actually happening here? Did Musk suddenly get really concerned about the plumbing after offering $44 billion on the house? Is he trying to haggle the price down, as suggested by his recent tweet that the deal might be, quote, viable at a lower price? Uh, or is he trying to get out of the deal entirely now that Twitter stock is about 30% below his asking price and Tesla's lost about one third of its value since the Twitter drama began? <laughs> Notably, Musk was planning to leverage his Tesla stock in order to afford Twitter, and Tesla stock is the primary source of his massive valuation. Some speculated that the Twitter deal was at least in part to move, uh, to in part a move to sock away some of that volatile Tesla value in a private Twitter while controlling the platform that he's used to amplify his wealth and maintaining a certain persona. And I'm I'm kind of favorable to that theory. Yeah, but you you voiced that theory. So yes, <laughs> it's hard to say for sure, but this juncture is, in the story certainly has the feeling of of a moment of reversal. Now the Twitter board is pushing the deal, filing a preliminary proxy statement with the SEC and urging shareholders to vote in favor of the deal. And it's not super hard to see why. His original offer is way above market price now. Meanwhile, it's not at all clear that Musk can put the deal on hold or knock the price down or worm his way out of it, if that's his intention, since there is a, quote, specific performance provision in the language of the Twitter deal that enables one party to legally compel the other party to abide by the agreement. <laughs> The deal's easiest out for Musk seems to be a simple failure to assemble funding. That is one provision that can bring it down. So while there's no way to know what's happening or what's going on in anyone's head, it's really not outside the realm of possibility that Musk might have to go through with a troll acquisition that he has come to regret. Oh, oh my, oh my goodness. And, and, and I'll tell you, uh, talking about uh, trolls, um, this is, this is, this is crazy on its own. Let's just <laughs> put it right there. Okay. This is crazy on its own, but let me talk about, uh, a Texas law that almost made it into my news today, but did not, uh, there, there's a, uh, the court, there, there's a court that has unblocked a Texas law that would prevent, According to what I've been reading, and I'll explain why I say that, uh, that would supposedly prevent companies like Twitter from sanctioning people for their, you know, for their, their content. So when mm -hmm. they post content, you could not say moderate them, essentially. So, so basically trying to prevent content moderation. Basically, basically preventing content moderation altogether. Um, now, the, there's a legal battle going on with this um, because, <laughs> get this, on the theory that the inability to, uh, to moderate content violates a company's right to free speech. Uh-huh. That was the first place my brain went. <laughs> okay. So, um, let me just say, I am not a lawyer. Okay. So take everything that I say at this moment with a grain of salt. Um, but I have read through this law and that does not appear to actually be what it says. Um, it appears to say that what it appears to say is these, um, so yes, yeah, <laughs> right. you need to also get the other camera on there. You know, the one, you know, the one Sharla, um, <laughs> that's the one, um, what was I saying? Oh yes. So I've read it. And basically what it says is these, these, uh, social media platforms, basically any platform that has more than 50 million active monthly users, which would be you know, Twitter, Facebook, 
et cetera, uh, that they are common carriers, you know, like phone companies essentially. And, um, that as such, they should be regulated as such. Now, the thing is that I'm seeing in the law that they have the ability to set policies and moderate based on those policies. That's what I'm seeing. Okay. But others who may or may not be better at reading these things than I am are saying, no, no, no. It prevents these companies from, you know, performing moderation, but I'll tell you what else the law does. Uh, it also requires them to explain their algorithms. So I don't know. I don't know where this goes, but um, yeah, definitely. Again, I am not a lawyer, but the fact that he started pulling this the day that the court said that that law could go forward, I think it would be some kind of poetic justice if he bought Twitter because he didn't want people to be, um, didn't want people to be uh, 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 kicked off, and then he lost the ability to kick people off. <laughs> uh, the uh, the example given in the register was, you remember that scene in Ghostbusters where they turned off the ghost containment system? Yeah, kind of like that, <laughs> only worse. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I At some point, you just kind of want to smack him in the head. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's... <laughs> Yes, yeah, sweet, sweet Schadenfreude. We, we try not to indulge in it too much. And in fact, we, you know, we want what's best for everyone. Uh, so I want to, yeah. I want to extend some data-driven life advice today for our, our, our last piece here to Elon Musk, but also to all of us. Uh, and that is to log off. Log off. Uh, this it. week, Georgetown computer science professor Cal Newport published a blog pointing to a study published in the Journal of Cyber Psychology, Behavior, and Social Networking, titled, Taking a One-Week Break from Social Media Improves Well-Being, Depression, and Anxiety. Newport praised the methodological design of the study, which compared a control group using social media, as usual, and an intervention group told to abstain for a week. Quoting from the report, at a one-week follow-up, significant between-group differences in well-being, with a mean difference of 4.9, depression with a mean difference of negative 2.2 and anxiety with a mean difference of negative 1.7 in favor of the intervention group in all those cases were observed after controlling for baseline scores, age, and gender. The intervention effect on well-being was partially mediated by a reduction in total weekly self-reported minutes on social media. The intervention effect on depression and anxiety was partially mediated by a reduction in total weekly self-reported minutes on Twitter and TikTok and TikTok alone, respectively. So translating that a little bit, that means even just logging on less made people happier, um, uh, even if they were uh, you know, not totally abstaining. Back to the quote. The present study shows that asking people to stop using social media for one week leads to significant improvements in well-being, depression, and anxiety. Future research should extend this to clinical populations and examine effects over the longer term, unquote. So next time you're thinking about spending $44 billion or the robots <laughs> got you down, maybe just log off. <laughs> there you go. Very, 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 so, so very true. And, and great, great advice. Great advice. I know the one upside of when my internet goes out is uh, we get happier here. <laughs> you you would think that we would be really stressed, but no, no. We 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 had we were out of internet for like a week, and at the end of that week, we were so disappointed when it came back on. So yeah, and and our and we're cord cutters, so we had no TV during that time either. So you can imagine what an effect it must have had. Oh, goodness. Okay. Does that bring us to wackadoodle? It brings us to wackadoodle. All right. Yes. Finally, as per usual, we'll close out today with wackadoodle, the segment where Nick quizzes me on news of the week that might be surprising, absurd, or just reminds us what a weird wackadoodle world we live in. So what do you have for me this week? Okay. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so there was, uh, there was a situation, uh, in, New York, 
where there was an animal uh, that had to be returned to the wild. Uh, what was it? Elon Musk. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah. So apparently, uh, no, no, it was <laughs> no, it was not. No, it was not. Um, apparently, there was a moose on the loose uh, in a New York. A moose on the loose. A moose on the loose. Uh, it, it finally, it uh, finally, it found itself. The young moose eventually found herself inside a shaded, fenced-in backyard located in Schenectady. And uh, so she uh, she was finally <laughs> returned to the wild. Can you imagine? You look out in your backyard, and there's a moose. One of my uh, one of my best friends in high school worked for McDonald's, and a, a buffalo came through the drive through window. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, like literally came through the window, or uh, no, no, walked by as though it were a car. Uh... Oh, that that's funny. That is funny. One day, uh, my wife said so we we lived on the water, and my wife says there's otters in the backyard, and I'm like, what? You know, she might as well have said there's a unicorn in the garden, but uh, yeah. All right, how about this? Uh, so there was a meeting on, uh, this was, this was, uh, oh, this was a couple of years ago, but, um, there was a meeting where, uh, officials from the department of defense said that, uh, an aerospace threat program, uh, had discovered what? aerospace threat program had discovered uh they finally found the ufos i think that is correct <gasps> is that my first correct answer Maybe that I'm, is that is not that's your that's first good. correct answer but it is correct it is correct former high level officials and scientists uh with deep black experience uh came forward and said uh that they there there are government agencies which may have programs investigated unidentified aerial phenomena so UAPs, uh, yes. So that so you you got that one. Um, let us see here. There was one more I wanted to hit. Okay, I got I got two more. Um, there is a uh, a post office that is hiring. Um, uh, there's a post office that is hiring. Um, but there is one downside. Uh, can you tell me what the downside is? Uh, you got to upload your consciousness to the uh, vast digital head mind. Uh, no, uh, it is Ant it is the post office for Antarctica. <laughs> you say downside. I, yeah, I don't understand. Downside. There, there you go. Exactly. Uh, the post office at Port Lockroy, also known as the Penguin Post Office, is a popular destination on Gaudier Island, just off the west side of the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, so, yeah. So part of your job is also watching out, uh, counting the number of penguins and penguin chicks on the island. Uh, so there is that one. Well, if you don't see me here next week, it's because yes, I, you got a new job. Well, it is a seasonal <laughs> job that runs from November to May. So it's almost, uh, so it's almost over. Uh, yes. Downsides are that the temperature goes down to 23 degrees and there is no flushing toilet or running water. Uh, you may go as long as two weeks without a shower, uh, Typically, uh, passing ships will allow uh, staff members to come on board and get showers. So there you go. So there you go. Sounds All right. great. One last one. Uh, a new millipede species was, uh, was discovered, and it was named for blank. Hmm. 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 I got nothing. What was the name for? Okay, so I'll give you a hint. Uh, the Latin name is Nenaria Swifte, and the vernacular name is the Swift Twisted Claw Millipede. Swift Twisted Claw Millipede. Yes. Uh, my brain's going to, you know, 
uh, Apple's Swift programming language. Uh, so yeah, name, name that. Think more. That. Think more pop culture. Taylor Swift. And Taylor that, Swift. That reveals something about me that my brain went to uh, the Swift <laughs> language before Taylor Swift. Anyway, that is that is very true. I I, I not I don't think that's a bad thing, Eric. <laughs> Well, it, it is what it is. It is not. A, it is not a bad thing. Yes. So, uh, so Derek Hannon, uh, the entomologist who uh, who named the species, named it in Swift's honor uh, because uh, he he felt that her songs had gotten him through some rough times. Uh, so his favorite songs are New Romantics and Betty. So there you go. So that's wackadoodle for today. I think it's kind of sweet, actually. Actually, you know what? I've, I've, got, a, too. I've got a surprise one for you. Oh, um, oh, great! I love when you have them. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. No, I'm not, not sharing my screen yet. That would give it away. Uh, so this week there was a popular uh, hacker news post going around talking about a neural net used to create what? A neural net used to create what um a 3d representation of the thoughts of the entire world <laughs> beautiful oh well, that's gorgeous um no it is magic cards uh magic cards. <laughs> and i would like to oh i've got to see these show you what this looks like we're yeah. talking about magic the gathering here In indeed magic the gathering uh, uh the, this is a card game for those who are not uh familiar Indeed. Uh, let's see. I need to. I shared the screen, but I'm not sure it is. It's we can't. We don't see it. I'm gonna try once more, and if uh, that doesn't work, then oh well. Uh, I think we have someone who's been guessing on our wackadoodles. I just see LinkedIn users, so I don't know who it is. But um, so if you've been guessing on our wackadoodles, you've been doing a great job because uh, they got it. <laughs> They got all. They got uh, both of them. Well, oh, nice, anyway. nice. So, yes. Uh, I'm trying to share, but it's it's, uh, it's not just working, not LS. just um, not working. We'll we'll have to take your word for it. I'll I'll post the um, URL in the. Oh, great. Okay, good. Yeah. So we so so, so it'll be in the comments that people can take a look at it. And it's u r z a s dot a i. Uh, check it out. The the cards it makes are pretty delightful, but it, it brings up uh, kind of an interesting question of how much can game design be automated? Uh, you're, you're talking about a really mathematical space here where um, the, the effects of the cards are often, you know, balanced in such a way that their, their cost needs to sort of be proportional. Their cost to play within the game needs to be proportional to the kinds of effects that they create. And uh, I would love to just like print out 60 of these and play a game and see how it works. Yeah, why not? <laughs> Why not? I think that would be. I think that would be a lot of fun. I I've never actually played, so uh, maybe we'll have to do that. Uh, you know, in two weeks when we're in Boston. Yeah. So so there you go. Okay. Well, that's that's all I got. That's all I got. But I'm looking forward to seeing that um, that you are. You want you? Yeah. We'll have to put the URL in the comments and, and go from there. Uh, great. Okay. So, um, wow. Yes. I just looked, I just looked at these. Um, um, so yeah. So what you do is you, you, uh, you put in your name and then it, uh, puts everything together. Wow. This is, this is craziness. This is craziness. Okay. Um, and that's a scary creature that I just created. Okay. <laughs> well, here, wait a minute. I'll, I'll share on my screen. Um, at least I'll try and share my screen. Uh, da, 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 share. Share. Uh, share. Chrome. There we go. Share. Can you see it? Yep. Yes, there it is. Okay, so I just put in, it, it asks you to name your card, and then it um, creates the card. Uh, that is a very scary uh, creature. Right but there. you can uh, you can pay two uh, to sacrifice it, so that's good. You can get it out of there. Yeah. Oh, my. Oh, my goodness. I. That's, wow. That's, that's, 
Its Nutty. leaves have no eyes, no fear, and no tongue. So there's always uh, on the bottom of these cards uh, sort of narrative text here, and, and that's obviously AI generated as well. So uh, that's, yeah, that's what AI gave well, let's see. Let's see what happens if we name one after you. Oh no! Yeah. Oh no! Yeah. Let's let's see. Oh, oh okay. Uh, the human pirate. Well, I started okay. out as kind of like a dolphin, and then. Uh... <laughs> wow. Okay. That's nuts. Uh, Ethereum spells you cast cost one less to cast. I didn't know uh, I was in crypto there. Uh. That's the pro well, I lost my screen here. The problem with humans is they can't read the C. <laughs> okay. So, you know, it's interesting to see, to see this kind of um, use for, you know, what you can do with, with a neural network. Yeah. You know? So um, that's so, that's crazy. This was actually one of the more impressive kind of neural network demos to me because it was working on on multiple different valences, right? We've got the art, we've got the the narrative text, we've got the the game design element with the the costs and and effects of the cards. Uh, so yeah, pretty cool. Yes, very very cool. Okay, so I'm glad we were I'm glad we were able to share that um, and and give a good example of uh, why we need to keep an eye on uh, artificial intelligence because it's getting very good. It's getting very good. Okay, so I think that's it. Um, so I just uh, it just remains for me to thank all of you who joined us live. We are here uh, every Wednesday at 1 o'clock uh, unless something happens. Uh, and uh, we, we thank you all for joining us live and uh, also those of you who join us uh, on the download, either video or uh, on audio. Um, and uh, I also want to thank Sharla. Sharla? Sharla, thank you. I'm terrible with names. I want to thank Sharla for filling in for Nika, who will uh, presumably be back next week. And of course, thank you, Eric. Uh, could not do the show without you. Uh, all right, all. Thank you all. We'll see you next Wednesday. Take care. Bye-bye.